And all you know how important is Middle East uh, to the West, and especially to the United Kingdom. And all we know that uh, past more than two years, so many uprisings started what can be called as Arab Spring, starting from Tunisia and ended up in Bahrain and still struggles coming going on. In all these countries, all these uprisings have been settled down. And we can say we are not seeing the final chapter. I think it is still the beginning of the chapter. So maybe it is early to call it spring or autumn and let us see how the things go goes on. But um, in each different countries so a different diversion of how the uprising is continuing. Some places like Syria we can find the, 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 the uh, violence and the armed struggle going on. And in uh, contrast with that, in the opposite direction, Bahrain, which is the struggle is going on, but so peacefully because the opposition wanted to be peaceful uh, struggle. Uh, as all we know that how important the Persian Gulf is in the West, almost 35% of the fuel of the uh, uh, international fuel is going off from that area. And all we know is that the strategical location of Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Qatar is so important to the West because they are so uh, rich of oil <coughs> and gas. And definitely the stability of this region is so important to the international community and it's important to the allies of this country, mainly the United States and, and, uh, in, and the United, and United Kingdom. Um, in short, I will focus on Bahrain. Let us see that's what was going on and what is happening right now. Um, I can say that more than two and a half years ago, people of Bahrain rose launched their uprising demanding the change for uh, the change from dictatorship. As you know, there is a tribe called Al Khalifa family that are ruling in Bahrain uh, since more than uh, two centuries, exactly before 2030, they came to Bahrain. So the people of Bahrain, they want the change from dictatorship to the true democracy. The Bahraini people want real change, not cosmetic one. Why? Because the current regime, they are calling that they have a democracy. They say they are having constitutional monarchy. We think that it is not, it is absolute monarchy, it is not constitutional monarchy. They have been struggling since 1922, people, and time has come to put an end to their president's suffering. Their demands, based on elected government and elected parliament, having sole legislative and regulatory powers and truthfully independent judicial system in pursuit of democracy, opposition forces intended to fully and solely embarrass peaceful measurements. We are sticking with any type of the peaceful measurement and we are denouncing any type of violence. And whoever is acting violence, we are against the defense. The Bahraini regime continued cam um, campaigning of discrimination Easily you can find out the majority of the people who are Shia are banned to have any role in the military forces and in the security forces. And they continued their discrimination, hate, killing, and repression. The people have not stopped their struggle to do that. So the continuation of detention of more than up to now is more than 3,000 people are in the jail. These Bahrainis include religious scholars, senior figures, and many women and children. We have more than 70 children below than 16 years old are in the jail, just due to their political opinions. And in ch children indicating of brutality of the regime. However, such inhuman acts did not stop the people of Bahrain to continue daily demonstration. You can see daily demonstration. Yes, not all the time on the large scale but at least once a week is large scale, but during the day it's in smaller scale in different areas. Daily demonstrations in and many areas of the country till they get their legitimate demands. Over the past two and a half years, the world remained silent. This is actually, this is surprising us. Both international media and community were given less attention to Bahraini struggle 
to gain democracy and freedom. This ignorance is clearly visible within the most local media in Britain here, mainly. Moreover, almost all Bahraini opposition activities here in Britain are not being covered through the local and international British media. Meanwhile, it was expected from the UK, mainly, UK authorities, and United States mainly, to use all the available diplomatic pressure on Bahraini regime being as their strategic allies. And really, it is a very, very big question for us. Bahrain being a dictatorship type of the government and regime, but it's considered to be strategic allies to the uh, uh, British authorities. And here the question comes, how come they are so supportive of this type of regime? To adopt a serious reform leading to a true democratic change. <coughs> However, they help Bahraini authorities in various forms, mainly the British governments. In various forms, including the dispatch of security experts and consultation <coughs> to improve and train security forces to stop their brutal behavior against peaceful demonstrators in Bahrain. But the repression, violence, torture, and arbitrary detentions by the authorities have continued up to now. And we are commemorating now a uh, uh, second year of what we call BICI record. A committee has been assigned to make investigation about all these uh, brutal actions we made from 2011 and onward by the king himself. And Mr. Bassouni, Professor Bassouni, reputed, uh, 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 who was in charge of this type of investigations by United Nations, he assigned this. And he made a very good report, I think, out of it was 26 recommendations. Unfortunately, the government, after two years, did not apply these recommendations. Maybe just two to three out of 26 they applied. Additional to that one, the United Nations Human Rights Council in May 2012 uh, in, in Geneva, they addressed to Bahrain uh, 176 recommendations. All the countries, they made it clear up to now, we think, Bahrain's authorities didn't apply these recommendations yet. So, at the end, the considering of the West values to respect human rights and to implement democracy principles in their political system, a major question remains unanswered to the people of Bahrain. Why is there such undemocratic, undemocratic states as Bahraini regime remains a strategic alliance to British and United States? while the demands of people of Bahrain are legitimate and considered to be their basic rights. So our call is to support democracy in Bahrain, and we should encourage development of democracy elsewhere in the region. And definitely, if we started with Bahrain, it will be spread elsewhere. If we want the Persian Gulf to be stable, and if you want uh, to strengthen our relationship with that area, I think this thing is to have a good and strong relationship for long run for Bahrain. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. <laughs> could, I, could I give everybody three minutes to pick up uh, whatever drink you want, and uh, I can serve you a bit, and then we will come to it. Uh, I'm grateful that uh, you have invited us uh, to speak about a very important uh, issue, the situation the Muslim uh, uh, community is going through internationally. And um, I would add a little that, that the responsibility what the Western world has to deal with this uh, turmoil that has been created over the period of the last three, four decades. Um, my name is Taha Qureshi, MBE. I'm chairman of Forum for International Relations Development. Uh, we are based in Saturn. Uh, it's a UK-based think tank. Uh, we do have an international charity, Stockwell Green Community Services, just on the side of the river, from Stockwell. Uh, and we do have uh, three academic institutions where we offer higher uh, education. We have a number of scholarships for the uh, communities in the UK as well as uh, international communities. A uh, number of universities are working clo very closely with us. My personal uh, area work is countering extremism, radicalization, 
de-radicalization and rehabilitation of those, particularly the UK, who have been charged under terrorism act related offenses. We work with Spain, Holland, Germany, UK, United States, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Our uh, number of programs on uh, uh, de-radicalization and counter-radicalization have been uh, taken by the Home Office, Metropolitan Police, and the European Union. Our work started well before 9-11 uh, and definitely is being documented by the Middlesex University and our subjective prime ministers uh, from 2000 onwards. The issue of uh, Muslim uh, community, what uh, is going through in the 21st century, I think I would like to remind uh, the, the members, um, I'll take back, I'll take you back to the time of Afghan Jihad when it started, uh, and the Iraq Iran war. Uh, our friend has mentioned the, the persecution of uh, Shia community, um, and I think it is uh, evident that our support uh, to Arabs at that time uh, to attack Iran for a number of years, uh, for eight years at least. Um, that has uh, created uh, uh, such a fraction between now uh, the, the Shias and the, the other parts of the community uh, all over the world, that Iraq-Iran conflict. That is one aspect which I think we must not forget, that what is our role, what we have played to bring the Muslim community into that kind of uh, situation. We have unfortunately due to one reason or another, have a play in the hands of Arabs to uh, destroy the relationship what Shia and Sunnis were enjoying for centuries in those regions. The second aspect when the Afghan Jihad started, uh, we very unfortunately uh, again uh, took the Arab countries and gave them lead to spend money and create this havoc uh, particularly in the borders of Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And again, this Arabian money has destroyed the relationship in particularly in Pakistan and what we see today. Uh, recent incidents, I don't know if you've heard what's happened in, in Rawalpindi, Islamabad, and many other cities of Pakistan. There have been for three days of curfews uh, and hundreds of people have been killed. Uh, and it's, it's been going on for uh, decades now. So. This is something which the, the Arab world, uh, with this very strong support of Western allies, has uh, created in uh, this uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula as well as in, in Pakistan. So this is something which we, we need to really revisit where we went wrong and how this, how and how much it has contributed towards this, this destruction of the very strong hold of uh, Muslim communities, particularly in Iraq. I, I can't remember that we have seen that many uh, destructions and that many killings uh, in Iraq in Saddam Hussein's time. I'm not very fond of it. I didn't like the guy at all for a second, but we did not see uh, that much damage what, uh, due to uh, some reasons, uh, we have had to happen in, in Iraq. Uh, we have seen uh, in Libya now, uh, there was a control. See, we somehow think that our democratic model uh, should be adopted everywhere in the world. Uh, I don't think we, we understand the composition of our community, how they work with the tribes. We have now 37 militia groups in Libya, killing one another. We have created a complete anarchy there. In Iraq, we have seen what's happened. And we were supporting Democracy in uh, in uh, Iraq, very unfortunate. When a democratically elected government came, what did we give to the Muslims? We gave an organization, a complete power there, which were pro-Islamic. There's nothing wrong being pro-Islamic government. I don't think there's any problem with that. But we all knew what, what was going to happen. But still, we supported democracy. When the democratically elected government took over, now we have gone against that. We immediately have supported the military regime there. I think this is not sending a very good signal to the Muslim uh, uh, communities uh, all over the world. That West is uh, uh, supporting democracy where they see their benefit. 
Why aren't we supporting democracy in Bahrain, for example, our friend mentioned? Why aren't we supporting democracy in Saudi Arabia? So if, if democracy is a so good animal which we need to really uh, bring up with milk and apple and all that good food, why don't we support this democracy in, in those countries uh, where uh, we, we do not have that kind of interest, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia uh, and, and, and uh, other uh, United Arab Emirates? So this is a, a one area I, I thought probably we'd remind our friends to, to look at. And now the, the, the damages it has caused. Uh, in, in the case of Syria, for example, uh, I really am I'm pleased that our parliament uh, did not pass that uh, the bill. Otherwise, we have created an other uh, uh, state uh, like Libya and Iraq. Now, I don't know how many of you really know that how many people just from South London have been killed so far. Anybody has an idea? I know 28 people, at least, they have gone from Britain to fight in Syria. Just from South London. And they have been killed. And there are hundreds in Syria at this moment. So we must not uh, think that our democratic system is the best system and that should work. I'm proud of uh, uh, living in, uh, uh, in a democratic country. This is a country which uh, uh, picked me up from here to there. And it has elevated my status. I studied in Bradford University. When I came here uh, from Pakistan in 1989, I came in Bradford. I couldn't speak a word of English. But this is a country which gave me opportunity to go to the university and got my honors degree from there. This is a country where I have established my very big business. This is a country where we are the only organization that has that model of triangular model of containment, which has been adopted by the British government and now is being adopted in Spain, Holland, and Germany. So we are very proud of it. But will it work in Iraq and Libya and, and other, other Arab countries? I doubt it very much. What have we gained? To, to mess about in Muslim countries. Fair enough, we have our interests. We need to lead the world. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. But we ought to understand the composition and the style of operation whichever country has. In Syria, uh, Asad Rajim, whether, whether he is bad or good, but what we see today as compared to one year ago, things are gone worse. And they're not getting better at all. I don't think with the Arab money, these uh, terrorists, I call them terrorists as a matter of fact, these are, if they're not AQ, they're AQ inspired people who have gone to Syria now, but that so called jihad and uh, turned upside down in that country. Same people have gone to Libya, same people are in Iraq. And now uh, you've already seen the, the results. We haven't, we haven't been able to change Afghanistan. Or have we? Have we made those women to take their blue book off? I don't think we have. That's their tradition. Have we made them to take their AK-47 off their shoulders? No, that is their tradition. They will, they will carry that. They will never, ever forgive their enemies. And now that, 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 that war has gone to Pakistan, we saw only 177 here. Whereas in Pakistan, we see 77 every day. Every day, Army headquarters, Pakistan Naval headquarters, Pakistan Air Force headquarters have been attacked by those so-called Taliban or terrorists. Pakistani mosques, the Shia worship places, Imam Bargas, and uh, Christian worship places, Ahmadiyya worship places, you name it, the, the ordinary markets, they've all been attacked. It's not only one community in Pakistan, they are being persecuted. It's the entire nation is being persecuted. So this is something which we really need to sit back and think in which country we need to go in, what kind of support we could provide. Are we really capable of providing that support? Do we really have exit strategy or forward strategy to take that one nation from one step to another? And finally, my, my observation is that 
if we want to support democracy, then in Afghanistan, I, I think that nearly three years ago, four years ago, I was in, in, in the International Center for Counterterrorism, uh, where, where I was invited in The Hague to, to speak, and I met the European uh, NATO commander. And in my speech, I, I suggested that in Afghanistan, we need to give this control to the United Nations. And American led coalition need to pull out of there. And give that control only to hold elections, not to fight with Taliban. We have pushed Taliban <clears throat> into a corner with AQ. Al Qaeda was not that big organization in, in, in Afghanistan. But Taliban, they were in hundreds and thousands. What we have unfortunately done is we have made AQ and Taliban one very strong group. Now it is not Al Qaeda at all. Uh, there is no Taliban at all. It is Al Qaeda inspiration, the ideology which five people sitting in a university could just go into that mode. And that is happening. We've seen that here in the UK as well as in, in other parts of the world. So finally, if we need to support democracy, then I think our democracy should be just one model. Whoever wins by the votes, we give them the power to control the, and run the country. Nonetheless, with the caveat that we need to develop their capacity. Had we developed the capacity of Taliban then, when they were democratically actually running the country, had we developed their capacity then to come to that level which the international world accepts, things could have been different. But what we did, we made them our enemies. Now we are again having dialogue with same people who we think are the terrorists. I stop it there. Is any question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before, before we go to the others, can I ask first Khalid Mahmoud? Uh, yeah. I'm really looking to the point. In terms of Syria, uh, I've been saying for over 18 months the issue of British uh, people going out there fighting. I couldn't get the, the minister or the uh, foreign secretary to agree to that until six months ago, until about four months ago, when the intelligence report came out and said there are some people going. Uh, and we know that the number of people going started off with the expat Syrians and the uh, Kurds, then a lot of uh, extreme young Muslims went across. I know that they're directly going, you know that they're directly going. Two uh, constituents only a few weeks ago from my constituency went across there to join Al-Nusra, who are uh, Al-Qaeda inspired uh, people. So we know that's happening, we know that's happened. And I, they agree with you with the analysis of why this war needed to start in the first instance. You see, I think sometimes we get our policies back to front, very much so. Uh, the whole thing that was started off in Syria was started off by the Akhwan uh, al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood. And we knew that. If anybody decided to speak the intelligence authority, they would know that. It was started off by them. These are the people that we've been against for the last 15, 20 years. So why all of a sudden do we want to support them? We supported them, Al Qaeda came in, Saudi money, Qatari money, all that came in, the Turkish support came in, and this happened. And, you know, we talk about the bloodshed and the, 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 the children that are killed, maimed, and, and, and uh, left orphaned, and we want charities to go and help them. Why have we created this in the first instance? Had that vote not gone ahead, had that vote not gone ahead on that Thursday, yes, there would be far more courage. Instead, we managed to get it through normal channels and, and got rid of the, the, the chemical weapon, which are absolutely abhorrent, and nobody would support that. So we've got to look at how we handle some of these blocks. I so quite agree with the Christian on that aspect. I also think there are real issues that need to be dealt with in terms of democracy. And I didn't say this today, I said this in 19, uh, sorry, 2003, uh, when the British Council launched a campaign and a book on democratic democracy in the Arab world. And <laughs> the problem with all of that, as Mr. Chris said, is not about an election. It's about what you prepared beforehand. It's the transparency, it, it, it's the accountability of those societies, it's those democratic structures that need to be in place to do that. And we've done the same to Pakistan. We said to them, we're going to get rid of this military dictatorship, 
and put you in, in charge of a, of a democratic process. We had one government, which is probably the most corrupt <laughs> government that's been there. People are at their wit's end, have no food, have nothing, and we, 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 we all say, and our foreign secretary is saying, oh, fantastic. It's, it's, it's a democracy. We've now got a different government that's come in. I don't know where that's going to go. I don't see it any better. We've got a huge issue with the peoples and who are being exploited by their own people. And if we're going to do anything, we're going to look at real ways of dealing with these issues and not jumping in and doing this and jumping in and doing that and not intervening in terms of Iran and, in, uh, sorry, Bahrain and intervening in other places in Libya. Or look, what's that? Well, we're going to change Libya into, into a democracy. Just look at the TV today of, of what's going on. And we've got to then, at least some states, go, uh, come back and say, look, guys, this approach doesn't work, isn't working, it's not going to work. So, you know, I think we do need to look at sort of unknown colleagues who want to be before we go along. Thank you very much. David Ward, uh, I know there is a word from so the five minutes. Yeah. Um, I think the, what you did refer to was uh, uh, the Mashini issue. And, um, be interested in some of your thoughts on that. I was in uh, Jordan last week, and, is it big, big team? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, with that name drop, we, we met, the delegation met with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister, and you know, about 600,000 of Syrians and uh, refugees who uh, were visited and lost positive refugees <coughs> for many, many, many years. But the Prime Minister uh, was certainly of the view that almost uh, with, you can trace almost any of the issue in the problems across the region back to the Palestinian issue. I just wondered whether you had a, a, a view on that. So. Well, I think that well, we, will, we will come back. Can I ask Dave to say a few words and then you can comment both of you. What's your way? Perfect, still the voice. Probably my dear start, I was in Israel in 2006, just after the mass, to be elected in Palestine. And myself and the other and they insisted we would only go and we would make a bus. Four of us didn't want to make them, but we insisted. That's the only way we met them. And the guy who was with me, Richard Howland, he was the European Invasion Southeast. He'd been there when the elections were going on, and he said they were the fairest elections he'd ever seen anywhere in the world. And before we start getting on table, like, the Bahrainis, the Libyans, the Saudis, we have to be ourselves because we've chosen, we only chose to support democracies <clears throat> when they know what we want. So we're happy to turn a blind eye when Saddam was wiping thousands of people face the earth because he was keeping the yeah, Ayatollah time up. We're happy to turn a blind eye to the Saudis because he keeps us blind and on, but we're not happy to sit back. And that the Libyans do what they want, as you said, although it was tough, at least there was some sense of stability. And I think one of the saddest things of the last few years is there was a huge amount of hope when President Obama was elected. And all that hope has disappeared. It really is sad the way that has turned out. And frankly, I don't see <clears throat> any party on this side of the Atlantic in this country, changing the views and changing the way we relate, particularly in the Muslim world and the, the world in general, the Middle East. Although we see all the right things, we have huge words, we won't actually do anything different. And I don't see, again, even more sadly, the Americans change the way they've been. And that's a real, real disappointment. <coughs> Whether we say change, if we had a president who is supported by both houses of Parliament in America, perhaps that would be positive, but that's a no more we have. So I'm sorry to be so despondent, I'm not usual. I just think that um, we need a reality check when it's coming to us. We are seeing all the right things on any level when we're not done with. And it was almost, I think we were all there, the reality around the vote on Syria. Was, and when it was planned, we got there almost by mistake. And that's enough for the party who said they didn't want to support 
what the company was doing, but we were still effectively seeing if we can get certain things, we will go to war, we will have military intervention. And thankfully, that has happened, but it was almost <coughs> the same by mistake. So, I leave that way. Miserable as it sounds. No, thank, thank you very much, but can I tell you also that they, in the next two or three weeks, will be visiting Syria. Uh, uh, I don't exactly give it with the delegation. So if, if you want to speak to him later on, it will be good enough. I, I know that he will be representing us all. So can I ask you to respond to all three? And then, then obviously yeah. there's a lot of discussion later on. Yeah. <coughs> I, yeah. As soon as bell, bell rings, you will go. So, I'm going now. Okay. <laughs> I can't, I can't get that time to vote. I know. Just responding to you. Will come that is the issue where world leaders are not leading by example. Uh, this issue has been there for, uh, about since 1948. Uh, we have a, a state of Israel there. I visited uh, last year. Uh, the condition for a state is the living in. That is a very, very unhealthy for a healthy mind, to have a healthy mind. Uh, and I don't think the situation is going to change unless Britain puts some pressure on Americans, and Americans, they lead the world to have independent state of Palestinians. That is my view on that part. And same is for Kashmir. Kashmir is another Muslim issue which has been uh, ignored for, for decades. And this is something which uh, we are very happy to uh, support uh, uh, any uh, uh, issue you bring, and it will be your soldiers, uh, David. Um, this is something which uh, is being discussed uh, almost in every uh, Pakistani Kashmiri house, and in every uh, forum, and in every conference. Uh, but the world leaders are not taking that serious interest like we took interest in East Timor and Southern Sudan to make independent states. It, with the click of finger, we got that done. But with Kashmir and Palestine, and we... There's, there's a huge frustration building on, I mean, I went to a Sydney meeting earlier today, and everybody asked the same question. We've met so many times, yeah. and I have probably been to, in the last 30 years, 200 mm. or more Kashmir meetings, uh, either here in the last three years, or in, in my constituency. And everybody asks the same question, why is nothing happening, why isn't it improving? Uh, we have all the United Nations resolutions we want. <coughs> yes. Um, they're all in place, um, but there isn't that international will, I'm afraid, to actually uh, put pressure on. It's the geopolitics, uh, with Kashmir, with obviously India, Pakistan, and other nations involved. Um, and then the huge involvement of America, I think, as Dave was saying, in terms of the Palestinian mission mm -hmm. and others. So we're, we're no, all very dis really despondent, depressed. No, David, but it is very important that we carry on our campaign because this is the most important topic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have a meeting later on sometime. Of course, definitely. Thank you very much. And someone else mentioned about uh, this. Yeah, uh, can you? Uh, Yes, I think we've covered this issue of uh, Palestine and uh, the, the, the democracy, what people were talking about. Uh, see, when we had uh, uh, democratically uh, uh, elected people in Gaza, what did we do with them? He said, yeah. He was in first time. He was in first time. Yeah. Uh, what did we do with them? Uh, when we have uh, democratically elected people in Egypt, what did we do with them? Uh, if we are talking about uh, democracy, then I think we need to really uh, uh, reach our allies first. You know, instead of talking to the those people who are not listening to us, why don't we just go in the Middle East and just start uh, uh, talking about democracy there? Uh, I don't think human rights are uh, being observed in the fashion we want uh, in the Middle East and many, many countries. Uh, but we turn the blind eye, as Dave said. Professor Victoria, you want to say something and then I'll come to Terry. And um, obviously, you will respond at the end. Yeah. Now we are in relax, so we, nobody is in hurry now. But I, I was a little bit uncomfortable about what you were saying about democracy being incompatible with Arab countries. Um, and one of the reasons you mentioned that tribalism to 
was done with Pledge of Egypt, which was a very non-tribal organization, which is older than any in Europe. Um, I agree with you about democracy, but any model, you know, any kind of model that we try to apply without any consideration of what are the local specificities is going to be a problem. It always has been development, modernity, uh, democracy is the same. But I also think, I'm picking up from, I, I think, David's, David's observations, and so it's also, and, and, and yours, um, democracy isn't just about elections, it has to be a process. And I think we've got a lot of work to do about democracy here and in the US and elsewhere in terms of, you know, building a democracy which is really from the people, inclusive, not based on gross inequalities, um, and which, you know, actually challenges the status quo. Not, not through violence, but through dialogue, through some kind of organization, uh, civil society organizations, etc. So I think that there's work to be done here, rather than think about a model of democracy that can be exported, because the model we are implementing has its advantages, but it has its you know, very obvious limitations as well. So we're not in a position to export. Um, and as I said, any model that you export without consideration for local, local, what local people's conditions are, what the local problems are, is going to is doing to pay. But I wouldn't say from that to say there's some inherent impossibility amongst Arabs or Latin Americans or Africans. We have to try to construct from the ground up in terms of something that is representative of what people need. And as many people as possible inclusive men, women, the poor, the middle, and I suppose the top part of it. It wouldn't be my first. Well, I obviously agree with a lot of what's been said about the total failure of Western policy and the disasters that it has brought uh, in Afghanistan, in and elsewhere. I think I've got a, a couple of, well, one point to make that, that does alarm me, and it goes back to 1960, and Eisenhower, in his uh, speech when he was leaving office, referred to the dangers of the military-industrial complex. And it seems to me that the military-industrial complex has grown stronger particularly in the US, but to a degree in the UK, and that, that, that the whole arms trade is an influential factor in public policy uh, to a, 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 a frightening degree. The, but two specific questions. One is the degree to which our current problems, uh, the current issues, reflect a Sunni-Shia conflict within the Arab world, and comments on that. And a specific comment in relation to Bahrain, because Bahrain had a lot of publicity at the time when uh, doctors and nurses who had treated uh, people were charged with aiding and uh, abetting uh, disorder. And that seems to have faded uh, away as an issue. <coughs> I'd be interested in asking a Bahraini colleague why he thinks there is this conspiracy of silence. Is it just that Bahrain is a, a good customer of the West that we don't want to offend? Is it because of the oil interest? Um, what, why is it that we have been so silent? Uh, Sandra, I'll come back to you. I think uh, there are quite a few questions from both of you, so I will start from the last uh, as well. So you responded, then start with Sam. Yes, uh, we feel that there is uh, a clear ignorance about the condition in Bahrain, although the vision and the status is so clear to the international community and uh, 
because this long time being after time of fear and the people are standing still to their demands and the demand is, as I mentioned, is legitimate demands. It is not uh, going to a hard line, at least part of the majority of the position. They don't want to overthrow the entire regime. They are demanding a serious reform, which is, should be obvious to the international uh, community, international world, that this is become a uh, logic demands. Uh, imagine we have a prime minister who stayed in power more than 42 years, uh, for more than 42 years since the independent of Bahrain in 1971, till now still is Prime Minister, he's now 78 years old. And uh, we want an elected government. We want uh, one man, one vote. We want uh, justice for all. We want uh, uh, no further discrimination against any type of citizens because he's, his, his, his faith or his, his, his part of certain sex sick. So uh, this is the basic demands. We want definitely to save our country in our army, in our uh, security, authorities, and so on. And uh, when it comes to the interests of us, now to your question, I think so many factors involved here. First of all, because Saudis are so uh, uh, in support of the current regime, and they think that Bahrain is part of the so this policy and all the international policy, foreign policy, and internal policy should be obeyed by Saudis. Al Khalifa's regime definitely they have to be part of the policy of our Sauds. Uh, secondly, because the majority of the opposition are Shia and they are afraid, and it can uh, be part of uh, uh, expanding Iranian policy within the Gulf if such reform started and for the opposition got some seats within the uh, government decisions making. Uh, and thirdly, because there's a fifth fleet, American fifth fleet, and historically the uh, uh, United Kingdom had they had very long relationship with uh, Al Khalifa family. All we know through the history, Al Khalifa came in Bahrain, they could settle down in Bahrain by support of uh, British colony during that time, and uh, all our uh, administration of systems built, built by UK and most of the consultant within the security levels and all, even within the King Court and the Crown Prince Court are all British. So there's a strong link between the interest of the Britain and the interest of these uh, Gulf states, and lately even United you know, Arab Emirates came in. Uh, and, and giving such support to the Bahrain regime. So now I think I can answer furthermore on this question related to what uh, uh, Professor Victoria just mentioned. I think time comes, we have to relate the democracy and the, our policy with the ethics, with the morals. And it is not just to our economical income or our financial uh, uh, income of our own interest in way of selling arms. We have before that, we have certain, as a human being, we have certain ethical values. We have dignities, we have freedoms, we have human rights. I think we should, as a politicians, as a parliamentarian, we have to combine these two all together. We shouldn't allow any country to have any type of strong relationship and be alive with any dictatorship countries. Or if we are, we should impose, like we are imposing on them how to protect our interests, we should impose on them these values. If they are not respecting these values, then somehow we have to change this type of relationships. Yes, democracy should be as a package, as Professor uh, Victoria uh, Shishi said. It is not just a vote. It is not just a changing some faces and bringing some parties to be in power, it will not work. It should be through a long process, through educational level, and meantime, it should be based on the citizenship. It shouldn't be based on the loyalty to a certain sectarian. We don't want, for example, for us in Bahrain, we don't want Shia to be in power. We don't want the interests of Shia to be protected, because it is at the end, it will make another opposition coming from Sunni, and later on will be more hardliners, and will happen like what's happening in Iraq now. We want the identity should be just a national identity based on the qualifications, 
based on others having better program for the development and this and so on. So at the end, I can say that still <coughs> this is our demand to the international community, to whoever can help us to transform the case in Bahrain through a serious reform. And I think they have the ability. Imagine sometimes one politician say a word to the one about they have international speech. For example, Obama in his speech in 2011 mentioned the name of Bahrain in his speech in the United Nations. So many considerations being taken in Bahrain related to the opposition. They want to try to crack down more and more opposition, but because mm -hmm. Obama, Obama just mentioned the Bahrain and mentioned the opposition in his speech, they try to be away from that one. I think up to that level, there is influence of the Western politicians, mainly Britain, I think, and the United Kingdom, uh, and the United States over the authority of Bahrain. And here it comes how we, as a politicians, as a parliamentarian, can affect these governments to do something and try to have these morals and their priority more than their political interests. Of course. Respond to the question which came up uh, from his friend, and then I'll ask the two colleagues uh, and anybody else as well. Well, I think there isn't any question, it's just a, a comment, comment uh, which the person made. Uh, I'll just dwell on that a little bit. I presented, uh, uh, I think, four scenarios with regards to democracy and uh, uh, Arab states. Uh, I gave uh, one example of democracy which we have tried to impose in uh, Libya and Iraq, and the fruit what we see is in front of us now. <coughs> and then I gave you another example of uh, democracy in uh, Egypt. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, I can't see why democracy shouldn't work there. It was working. They had uh, a few problems. Uh, don't we have those problems? And how many other countries? Uh, in Europe, we have see European autumn in many, many countries due to this financial uh, uh, crunch. So the problems were there, but we were very swift in replacing that democratically elected government. So I gave you another scenario uh, that we brought the democracy there, uh, but what did we get? And how did we change that so swiftly? So that was another scenario, not that other countries cannot have. So when I spoke about the tribes, I meant Libya and, and uh, Iraq, what we we have seen now, and the the uh, another scenario which I presented was that uh, why don't we support if it is a, a democracy if we want everywhere in the world then why don't we support in uh, countries in, in Middle East, for example Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar and other United Arab Emirates. So that, I think I've just presented those scenarios. Uh, I'm part of this, because I like democracy. Like uh, Andy Khalid said, that in Pakistan, uh, it is good or bad, but we have seen a complete five years of a democratically elected government, which hasn't given much to the ordinary public. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Adi did take over. There was uh, no Adi coup. And the transfer of power to the other party which won the election, that has been very smooth. So a person like me would say, well, democracy is working well in Pakistan. People are learning. People are being educated now. They see the, the, the fruits of democracy. They, don't, they won't see it now. But if this government completes five years, Hopefully, things will start changing. When I went to Pakistan in October, yes, latter part of October, I had to give lectures at uh, three, four universities. Peshawar University I went to, uh, Kadiyazm University in Islamabad. And Peshawar University, they, they raised this question, they were very angry that uh, in Pakistan we see Talibanization, it's this and that, you know, people want so much kind of, uh, you know, angry that Taliban, Talibans have taken over Pakistan. It's being, being Talibanized and... Wait a minute. The province that we, you are sitting in now, KPK, you don't have mullahs and Talibs uh, in the government. You've got Imran Khan's party in power. He doesn't have your beard. So 
people sometimes, and media, and Western countries sometimes, they, they, they just uh, portray such kind of image of Pakistan that is being run, controlled by the, 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 the terrorists and Taliban, Taliban nice people or those people who are inspired by Al-Qaeda, this and that. But actually, that isn't the case. There are tiny minorities, and we have forgotten, as a matter of fact, what IRA used to do in our country. So it, that didn't mean that IRA was controlling the entire region. Terrorists, they have to be successful only once. The government institution, they have to be successful 100%. Taliban, they show only one 9 11, and they are everywhere. But how many incidents, how many conspiracies they have unfolded? Uh, the, the security agencies, here in the UK as well as in, in, in the United States. So this is where I think we need to uh, show a little bit more responsible attitude, where democracies are new, for example, where democracies are, have uh, started, but they are not that strong what we see here in our country. Sometimes we start comparing democracy in Pakistan <laughs> with, with the British democracy. That, that is not going to work, and that is not how I think we should really evaluate democracy in Pakistan. I think I, 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 I know the Sandra and Kapale and Sheikh Sabu like to ask, but I don't want to deprive you from a wonderful sandwich, which are vegetarian and fish, okay. and there are some drinks. So please don't, don't waste, I hate to waste food. Okay, okay. So please have some food in front of you, and then we'll come back to Sandra, Kapale and Sheikh Sabu to go. Yes, and um, um, just uh, thank you very much. It's so good to hear someone speaking about Bahrain, which, as you said, has dropped off the calendar um, in the media, certainly in this country, and it shouldn't have, because there was so much hope two and a half years ago. And I remember writing a little lifestyle piece um, just before that for the FT, where I used to work. Um, so thank you for your comments. And what I'd like to say um, to uh, Mr. Kreshi is that I was in Iraq between the two Gulf Wars, and whilst Saddam Hussein wasn't a saint, far from it, one had a critique, and this is echoing what you said, I experienced. I was there for an international conference, in, in, um, an affiliation with Third World Solidarity and another group. And um, I walked around alone at night by the river, just going for walks. Um, women were in, in, in journalism, doctors, ministries that, that I met, in ministries that I met, and there was, it, everything has changed now, and it was really great. Um, well, everyone knows what's happened in, in Iraq. But what I'd like to say, I'd like to comment on the fact that Third World Solidarity, the APBG, um, we had um, Noam Chomsky here um, to speak in behalf of our group. And um, I, I actually did an interview with him um, for the Irish Times, uh, as I'm now a freelancer. Um, and really, Noam Chomsky was warning against what would happen in Libya. Um, a specific question I put to him. And you, you mentioned 37 militia groups. This is just <laughs> really quite shocking because we, we see bits and pieces, but I don't see a lot in the press about the cohesive picture about what's happened as a result of the West going into Libya. So I, I really, I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally enthralled about your, your, what you both said, and it echoes very much with meetings and our position in Third World Solidarity, it has to be said. Um, and I'm sure if I had my journalist mode on, hat on, I would be, I could have lots and lots of questions. But I'd just like, in behalf of Third World Solidarity, to thank you for commenting in such a succinct way, so briefly, so poignantly, um, which has given everyone here um, fodder for thought. And let's hope that the issues that you both raised can be taken to be heard more, basically. So, serious thanks for that. Thank you, very much. Kefale, as I said, Kefale is from Ethiopia. He's lived in Russia. He does speak Russian as well. I don't think he speaks Arabic or Urdu or Punjabi, but he does speak few languages. So, comments. He's our member of the Committee from East Africa. 
and we don't that either. Thank you, Mr. Lashari. I think there are two issues that uh, worries about the present world. One is the issue of democracy and its definition, and the other is sectarianism. It's a sectarian uh, violence across uh, the whole world. The um, issue of Muslim communities and the problems in Middle East and in Kashmir, they are linked to the other problems around the world. When most people talk about problems, they forget, for, for example, about the problems in Ethiopia. Because they don't link them, actually, <coughs> with the issue of uh, religion. But we have a considerable number of Muslims in Ethiopia as well. And the whole, this situation, sometimes uh, uh, creates uh, Inability, we cannot see the whole issues together. So we sometimes detach particular problems in particular areas, in particular regions. I think it's very important to focus on uh, ethnic based uh, uh, regions in the world. They are the future problems of democracy. They are inhuman, they are narrow minded. They will never agree with democracy. I appreciate uh, uh, my friend uh, when uh, he talked about Bahrain. He mentioned some issues of Shia <coughs> and other uh, sectors of Muslim religion. So these are the indications. When one big area is divided, we cannot keep the whole lot together. And we need to see all problems as a whole, as a global issue. <coughs> we will never forget the problem in Ethiopia. Yesterday we had a demonstration, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit longer, uh, in front of the Saudi Arabian uh, uh, yeah, uh, embassy. Most of us, we who understand the root of the problem, we are not really, we do not consider these problems as some people consider it very shallow. The problems are rooted in Ethiopia. We were trying to stress, we were trying to tell the public, it's not only the Saudi Arabia regime that is responsible for those people who are massacred, mistreated, imprisoned, persecuted, the destitute, innocent, and very uh, uh, poorly uh, living individuals. So let us focus the problem as a whole, then we can, of course, see uh, issues at a regional level, but we should not surprise this, and we should not forget the future big problem is uh, racism, ethnic based. I have seen it in Ethiopia, how violent. We have never seen such as atrocities in Ethiopia. People who are very culturally very good people. I mean, even though they are illiterate, even though they are poor, they have never shown this kind of attitude for Many, many thousand years. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kifale. Uh, Sheikh Sir. Um, well, I have, uh, I mean, I'd like to be educated a little bit more on that age <coughs> in terms of the fact that I did ask you <coughs> the total population of the country is 1.2 million and 600,000 uh, local Bahraini, 600,000 uh, residents from outside of the country. Um, how do you perceive democracy? in Bahrain, I mean, what is wrong with the current system um, or the whole of the Khalifa family on the, because I believe there is a Majlis Shura there, uh, which is fairly widely represented. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, by and large, the Bahrainis are, are living relatively in good uh, conditions. Um, 
when I was in Bahrain about um, six, seven months ago, and, um, my observations were a little bit, I was a little bit worried about the American forces because if you go to your main bazaar, which is, um, um, I saw a lot of Americans, you know, floating around these um, Navy guys and whatever, which obviously worried me a little bit. <laughs> Um, other than that, I, I really could not see, I, I can't really envisage, um, and perhaps it's best for you educators in that situation, in terms of the fact that why is it that the Al Khalifa, and especially the new king, why is it that he is so bad, or the, or the ruling family is so bad, and that democracy is not allowed to flourish? Um, or is it just because the rights of the Shias are being um, not being given to them as as they would be. Yeah. And the other observation that I have is that we we talk about problems, particularly in the Muslim world or in the Islamic world. Unfortunately, we ourselves are to blame for our own problems. We do not want to do anything about them. We do not wish to acknowledge that we have those problems. Because unless you, if I have a problem, if I'm smoking, I have a problem. If I don't acknowledge that I have a problem, it's never going to go away. So we've got to learn to establish for ourselves, that acknowledge for ourselves that we have problems. Then we've got to find solutions ourselves. Not rely on the West, not look for the West. We've got resources, so fantastic in the world. Uh, and about well human resource. Huge. I just have to find that, that, and that going somehow or the other. Of course, the, the, there are double standards. Um, I mean, one can appreciate the fact that uh, the talks about talks in Iran, they talk about they talk about talks, they talk about Iran, yet they don't work in Saudi Arabia. Many about Saudi and you know, yes, there is. I think we have to learn, we have to do it us all the time, and so this for us. They don't do that. We allow them to come and do things in our country.